Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back to our faculty presentation session one. And our first presenter is Josh Garcia. He is an assistant professor here at UC Irvine. His work primarily focuses on software testing, analysis, requirement engineering, maintenance, uh, security, vulnerability, everything and anything that you can think of. So <laughs> without further ado, I will let Josh start his presentation. All right, thank you for the introduction, Iskar. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming as well. So uh, this work is uh, conducted in collaboration with uh, Matthias Baer from uh, EPFL. And um, it's led by my student, Sumaya Almani, who is uh, sitting over there somewhere. And I encourage you to go and see her poster if you find this interesting and you want to learn more about it. So, so this talk is going to be focused on third-party libraries, uh, specifically of mobile apps, Android apps. Um, these libraries are integral parts of mobile app development. Um, they allow you to reuse functionality. Um, they are pre-tested to some extent, so you can have some confidence in their reliability. And in particular, uh, lots of these apps, particularly native ones, are used in social networking and gaming apps, which are, of course, very popular, right? Social networking apps are downloaded billions of times by billions of people. Um, and these libraries allow you to do things like uh, rendering, audio and video encoding, things that you want to do closer to the hardware because they are expensive <coughs> in terms of computation. Uh, and not only do these libraries get used quite a lot, they also get used in bad ways, right? Um, they, they are vulnerable, they can expose you to things like uh, this particular ad library that would result in having you pay for subscriptions you don't want. Um, and for example, 100 million downloads uh, were made of this particular can scanner app and unfortunately people ended up paying for things they didn't really want to. Uh, another example here is of a, of a library called Beta Plugin, another ad library. Uh, this one was so aggressive that for example you would barely be able to use your app um, and about 440 million Android users were affected by this. And so of course, there's a better need to understand the security implications of these apps and the usage of these apps, in particular in terms of their third-party libraries. And of course, lots of people have studied these, in particular, that, like the ad libraries that I talked about previously. However, all of them have focused on managed code, in particular, uh, Java code or Dalva code, which is the, the type of byte code that uh, Java compiles to in Android machines, uh, but they don't focus on native libraries. And la native libraries are important for a variety of reasons. <coughs> One, since native libraries are closer to the code, they're much more susceptible to memory errors or memory vulnerabilities. <coughs> you need to do things like buffer overflow attacks, out of bounds read errors. I'll talk more about these kinds of things in coming slides. And not only that, native libraries are really pervasive nowadays in the Android space in particular. <coughs> so about 90% of the most popular apps on Google Play use native libraries. If you only go back a few to several years ago, you'll find that only maybe about 5% of Android apps use native libraries. And now all of a sudden, they're just used pervasively. And so in fact, we looked at the top 600 apps um, and over 12,600 app versions and about 90,000 native libraries for the study I'll be talking about here. And unfortunately, these libraries are neglected. Even though I talked about their pre-tested, <coughs> of course, there's going to be regressions. Uh, people are going to prioritize new functionality, and they're not necessarily going to track their libraries and check to make sure that they're actually um, maintaining some kind of high quality and reliability as uh, these apps and the libraries evolve over time. And so what we did is we conducted a longitudinal study of third-party native libraries in Android apps, uh, taking into account the vulnerabilities those apps have, the rate at which those vulnerabilities are removed or fixed by app developers. We also assessed the outdatedness of these apps. Um, I won't be talking about this particular part uh, in this talk, but please, if you're interested, go talk to Samaya at her poster. 
And to do this, what we did is we created a technique called librarian. It stands for library version identification. And it leverages a similarity metric we came up with called bin squared sim. Uh, and of course, we created an app and library repository um, that we're constantly evolving so that we can track these kinds of vulnerability information in native libraries of Android apps. So librarian works as follows. Given both an unknown set of library versions and a known set, we use the known set of libraries to help us determine the unknown library instances. Uh, in particular, we need to do a first initial pass at library in, uh, identification that leverages the naming convention that the Linux documentation projects recommends you use for your native shared libraries. In particular, it recommends that you use something that looks like this. You name your library starting with lib, you provide the actual name of the library afterwards, your extension.so, and then you actually provide the version information. And of course, as developers aren't necessarily gonna do that, right? <laughs> They'll, for example, drop the, the version number. They may not, not even name it properly. They may name it like libx or something like that. Uh, in those kinds of cases, we can go back and use our, our known library versions to uh, get the rest of that information. But oftentimes, we can at least start with stripping all the other information using this native, native convention and knowing, for example, that this is most likely readline. And we can narrow the space of our search starting with that. We also can do a binary duplicate elimination. So as we have a growing set of known <clears throat> or unknown library versions, uh, we, need, we use a form of clustering based on hash codes and our um, our novel bin squared sim metric to reduce the duplicates, in this case from 90,000 to 10,000, uh, <clears throat> bringing this down by a factor of about nine times, which significantly reduces the amount of computa computation that needs to be done here, in fact, by months. Lastly, we were able to actually do the final version identification that gives us, um, with high accuracy, the actual version and library names of the native binaries that we want to identify. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about two particular components here of librarian that um, leverage that bin squared sim metric I was talking about to identify library <coughs> versions. So this metric compares a source binary and a tar target binary by extracting a set of features, which I'll talk about, and using a score calculator uh, based on a similarity coefficient, um, which is customizable, but uh, for us, what works well is the Jacquard coefficient. Um, if you want to learn more about that, again, find some way. <laughs> so I'm going to go into more details about this feature extractor. So what we ended up selecting are eight different features that help us identify libraries and their versions. Why these eight features? Well, we selected them such that they can distinguish based on what is called the semantic versioning scheme. So this major minor patch scheme that a lot of you software engineers here are most likely familiar with. It helps you distinguish between backward compatible versions, versions that actually change the API, and versions that just, for example, fix bugs or remove vulnerabilities. We also selected features that are available across platforms. What we mean by that is that they are not sensitive to, for example, the hardware architecture, the, comp the particular compiler settings you use, and so forth. So for instance, if you have a version that's x86 and ARM, um, I can tell you they're the same version. What are these features exactly? Well, overall, what they are, they're exported and imported global variables, functions, dependencies um, of these uh, libraries, and a variety of different string information. I won't get, go into these details. Again, you can go to the poster to figure that out. But what I will do is um, I'll move on to the application and library repository so I can give you an idea about 
more of the data set that we use to conduct this study. So again, we selected the most popular 600 apps from Google Play, uh, and we extracted their version history from a repository called AndroZoo, which actually contains about uh, 8 million or more different apps and their versions so that we can identify <coughs> release information and do this longitudinal study that we, we went about doing. Some app, app statistics for those of you that are interested. These apps, for instance, their, um, their lifespan covers, for example, about 2.3 years. Uh, the release of these apps typically occurs every two months. And some of these apps, for instance, live as long as about six years, which is long for um, an <coughs> ecosystem that's only lasted for about 10 years. <laughs> so native third-party libraries specifically, again, pervasive. 90% of the top popular apps in Google Play use native libraries. And for example, just take uh, one popular app. Uh, who here uses Instagram? Okay. All right, great. So Instagram, uh, 141 max libraries, 5,704 binaries in total uh, for 130 apps versions of Instagram. So a lot of native code for these popular <coughs> apps. Okay, so now let's go into uh, more of the meat of the study, the, the evaluation. For evaluation, we actually studied four research questions. I'm actually gonna go over three of them given the time constraints that uh, I have. The first one is about the accuracy of library, librarian to give you an idea that um, uh, we're actually able to identify versions properly so we can study other things like the prevalence of vulnerabilities and the rate at which vulnerabilities are patched, removed, or fixed. So for the accuracy study, what we ended up doing is we selected 81 distinct versions of 18 libraries for which we can get the exact information about the versions of those libraries. We ended up looking at nearly 4,000 binaries to do this. What we found is that uh, we had a really high true positive rate, uh, about 98%, close to 99%. No false positives and only 1% false negatives. And those false negatives um, are only occurring because uh, app developers, they like to modify libraries sometimes. For example, they, they like to shrink them so, so their apps are as small as possible. So now that you um, have some confidence, a uh, significant confidence, in fact, that librarian can identify versions of libraries with high accuracy, uh, let's look at how prevalent these vulnerable libraries are in uh, top apps on Google Play. So what we did is uh, we set up the following experiments where we looked at 500 different library instances. And what we did is we used criteria where we wanted to select libraries that are used by many apps and that have known CVEs. So CVEs are basically um, reported, well-documented vulnerabilities in the that are known to be out there in the wild. Uh, we went through a manual collection of the source code, and by we, I really mean Samaya, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, she went through official websites, other distribution channels like GitHub and Debian repositories. Uh, she looked at the binaries themselves, including different features of them, and narrowed it down to 52 distinct libraries with 961 library versions for which there are known vulnerabilities. So from a bird's eye view, uh, what we found is that about 17% of the native binar binaries are vu vulnerable, affecting 80 distinct apps, and 61 of them even remained vulnerable towards the end of the study. And a lot of them are probably still vulnerable now. But probably what's more interesting is once we zoom in into some of these apps. So let's look at some of these native libraries with reported uh, CVEs. So here we can see the, late, the native libraries, the number of versions that are affected, and the exact version numbers. 
For instance, here we can see that up to, for example, 696 different uh, versions of, of these apps are vulnerable from, for example, up to 42 uh, distinct apps. This is also the similar information except specifically for 2019. So let's focus on OpenCV. OpenCV is a computer vision library. It's basically mainly used for a variety of image processing in, um, in Android apps. But in particular in Android, it's used as part of Card.io, another library. What Card.io does is it scans credit cards for you, handles payment processing. So, and this OpenCV vulnerability, in fact, has an out-of-bounds read error. So you can imagine the fun things you can do with the out-of-bounds read error that allows you actually to extract information about your credit card. SQLite, so database um, library. So another, so if you uh, are, are worried enough about whether your data can be exfiltrated and you don't want it to, here's another reason to worry about it. Um, another example here, uh, this XML2 library, uh, it was part of um, Xbox Smart Glass. And what that does is um, Xbox Smart Glass allows you to access your Xbox using um, a Windows device. So you control things like your music, your videos, your games, and so forth. Um, and this vulnerability was out there for six years. So basically, like the entirety of the, the length of this study. So you're already getting an idea of the extent to which um, a lot of these vulnerabilities are just left there, hanging, unaddressed, so that potentially somebody who has um, a lot of time on their hands and a lot of interest in, in making your life worse uh, can, can use that for nefarious purposes. So let's focus on 10 popular apps from Google Play with, um, with still, existent, still existing vulnerable libraries. So these constitute billions of installs and users. So for instance, uh, the topmost one here, TikTok, includes um, GIFLib, so an uh, imaging library that uh, is, suffers from a buffer overflow attack where you can send a crafted image so that you can perform a denial of service just by sending an image. Similar uh, vulnerability occurs in uh, PixArt. Who here uses <coughs> Alexa? from Amazon. Okay, good. Good number of you. <laughs> okay, so uh, OpenSSL in Alexa had a vulnerability that appeared over three years ago. Um, and this, and OpenSSL in particular has a lot of den denial of service vulnerabilities that uh, people can potentially exploit. Uh, SQLite has an integer overflow um, error that can allow remote code execution. You can imagine what you can do with um, voice control if you can just use that in the right way. Who here uses Uber or Lyft? Okay, all right. Maybe some of you who didn't raise your hand may be either lying or not paying attention. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so Uber and Lyft uses OpenCV. Remember the out of bounds read error I was talking about before about your credit card payments? Can I, can who uses Uber and Lyft again? Okay. <laughs> yeah, me too. <coughs> All right. So now we know these are prevalent. At what rates do developers actually fix these things? Um, well, we measured that by seeing the the time at which a security update for these um, libraries <coughs> are released and the time at which it was actually fixed. So we're looking at a window of time here for the rate of update. So we looked at 19 apps and focused on these six libraries that are quite vulnerable. And in summary, what we found is that library developers um, are 27 times faster at uh, releasing their updates than developers are at actually fixing them. In fact, while a library developer can only takes maybe about 20 days on average to release a fix, App developers take like what, like a year and a half, nearly, to 
to actually update on average. How bad does this get? Um, let's look at some apps and vulnerable libraries in combination. Uh, here's the window of time it takes for the developers to actually, um, the, the developers of the libraries to actually fix the vulnerabilities in libraries. This is the time it takes for the app developers to actually handle that vulnerability in some form or fashion. Let's zoom in. Uh, if we focus on GIFLib, for example, where there's a heap-based buffer overflow vulnerability, 36 times slower. So it takes years on average for them to fix these things. And you may think this is potentially not a problem, but I mean, just think about all of the time it may take to just potentially update these libraries. Um, and it's also maybe a call for software engineering researchers to actually help people to do this quickly. <coughs> Here's that out of bounds read error you talked about before. Um, who here uses uh, PayPal as well? Okay. So here's one, here's one thing you'll notice. PayPal, Instagram, Taco Bell, and Subway. Um, for whatever reasons, while these uh, apps take years, for whatever reason, apps like Taco Bell and Subway just take months. So I, I hope you know you, we can all feel happy that um, Taco Bell and Subway are, are taking our, our security seriously. So these are the top 15 most neglected apps. <clears throat> uh, I won't have that much time to spend on this, but social network apps, some of the worst offenders here. Maybe not that surprising, given uh, the public shaming they receive already. Um, and again, Taco Bell and Subway, <clears throat> not so bad. Maybe social networking developers can learn something from from uh, these restaurant developers. <coughs> Clearly we've never been stalls. <laughs> yes, that, that could be it. And um, a future study that we hope to do can maybe <coughs> shed some light on that. So the rest are about 20 times slower than the, the app developers are about 20 times slower than the library developers. So in conclusion, these native libraries are pervasive um, and we've created a technique called Librarian that allows us to um, uh, do these studies about uh, the vulnerabilities in these native libraries and their outdatedness. And um, thank you very much for your time and attention. So, <clears throat> we have time for one quick question, and after that, uh, you can ask Kachim later. What are the mechanisms for what? Characteristics, for example, the apps that were fixed were in support of physical activity that the company is using, whereas the one that were late used as a virtual or, if you will, digital. Do not have a physical item typically or service or product that is supported. Is there any indication that this is the characteristic that plays, or is it just a matter of different business approaches with respect to companies? It just happened to be that social media companies say, well, the manager says, we don't have a reason to worry about it, whereas like the Taco Bell says, I'm going to get hit. And that's why the managers say, okay, let's do it, or is it just a completely random situation? So um, as far as uh, uh, we've been able to tell so far without doing a, a, a deeper study on the, this particular point, um, I don't think I divide it into physical versus just digital. I think the real issue here is probably what, um, what uh, Daniel here was pointing out to. Uh, probably it's the size of the apps. The more complex, the bigger they are, the harder it is going to be to apply these updates. And so um, we just we need mechanisms potentially to, to help speed that up so that these kinds of um, vulnerabilities and exploitability windows can be reduced. So, all right, thank you again.
So our next speaker is Dr. Na Meng, and she is an assistant professor at uh, uh, Virginia Tech. So her research focuses on understanding uh, software and understanding bugs and uh, how to uh, fix them automatically. And more recently, she got a very prestigious NSF Career Award. So without further ado, I will let Dr. Meng take the stage. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Na Meng. And uh, today, I'd like to talk about our recent published paper at XC, which is about our investigation on the security suggestions on the website Stack Overflow. And uh, this is a joint project among three universities, Virginia Tech, Technical University of Munich, and the University of Texas at San Antonio. It is also a joint project between the software engineering researchers and the security people. So the Stack Overflow is the most popular uh, technical Q&A website. According to the <coughs> homepage of this Stack Overflow, each month over 50 million developers come to Stack Overflow to learn, share their knowledge, and build their careers. With this website, developers can share and uh, uh, discuss about their expertise or opinions in solving programming issues. When one user posts a question, any user can answer this question or comment on the question. Other users can easily access this discussion thread between the question askers and the answer providers. And uh, given multiple answers provided to, the, to a certain question, a user may take the answer, which has received the highest uh, score, the accepted answer, the answer which has been provided by a person with high reputation, or the answer frequently suggested. So people attributed the Stack Overflow's success or uh, popular usage to its cross-sourcing model. In the model, there are two primary components, the reputation system and the voting mechanism. So in the reputation system, each user, can, each user has a reputation score which score can increase when user posts a question, answer, or comment. The voting mechanism allows users to upvote a factual and information post or downvote any low quality post or question, or maybe answer. So the voting mechanism can actually influence users' reputations. For instance, if the user's answers are widely accepted and upvoted a lot, the user's reputation score can increase significantly. <coughs> well, at the same time, the reputation system can also influence the voting mechanism. For instance, if a user has a pretty low reputation score, the user is not allowed to vote for any other one's post. So with these components, the crowdsourcing model intends to encourage contributors to provide high quality solutions and to facilitate question askers to identify people with high expertise. However, some recent studies reveal security vulnerabilities related to Stack Overflow. For instance, uh, the Fisher's group and the Mons group separately observed that some highly upvoted or even accepted answers on Stack Overflow contain insecure code. In particular, Fisher's group found that the insecure code snippets from Stack Overflow were copied and pasted to the Android apps available on Google Play. Uh, additionally, according to the research by Bars group, some high-profile applications that contain instances of such insecure code were successfully attacked. Consequently, user credentials, credit card, and other private data were stolen. It implies that the insecure code on Stack Overflow can negatively impact the security and the quality of our software systems. <coughs> Although prior work demonstrates the problem of vulnerability propagation via Stack Overflow, it is still unknown how serious the problem is. Taking a pessimistic view, if insecure suggestions are prevalent on this Q&A website and the community's corrective feedback is missing, then, novice developers may learn about this incorrect misleading information from Stack Overflow. They may propagate the misleading information to other developers or to their own software systems. And eventually, these developers make our software systems vulnerable to the known security attacks. 
Inspired by prior work in our research, we investigated the Stack Overflow's reliability regarding suggestions for the security implementation. In other words, we explored to what extent we can trust people's security implementation suggestions on the website. Therefore, for this study, we investigated the four research questions. The first question examines the prevalence of the insecure code. Namely, do insecure suggestions popularly exist on the website? The second question explores the usefulness of the cross-sourcing model. In other words, when both secure and insecure code suggestions popularly exist on the website, can we rely on users' voting and uh, reputation scores to choose a secure code over the insecure counterpart? The third question compares the repetition of a secure and insecure code. In other words, when a code snippet is repetitively suggested by different users, can we rely on such frequency to tell apart the secure and insecure code? The last question explores the motivation of duplicated suggestions. Actually, uh, specifically, when users repetitively suggest the same code multiple times, do they actually care about the security property of the code? Or do some users intentionally mislead other people by propagating this malicious code or insecure code? So to investigate these questions, we downloaded the Stack Overflow data, <coughs> extracted the code snippets from this answer post, and then leveraged the Java Baker to locate any code snippet that involves at least one security library API. Among the located code, we reused the domain security domain expertise or knowledge as summarized by prior work to manually label whether a given code snippet is secure or not. To describe it in a simple way, if a snippet matches a known vulnerable API usage pattern, we label it insecure. Otherwise, it is secure. Because there are thousands of snippets extracted to be like security relevant, it is almost infeasible for us to manually inspect all of them. Therefore, we apply the SysFinder to cluster similar code snippets and then only examine the similar code or code clones. Now let's see what we have observed. For the first research question, we observed that 45% of the inspected answer posts were insecure which means that the insecure suggestions popularly exist on Stack Overflow. We clustered posts based on the year when they were initially created. As shown in the figure, during the years between 2008 and 2011, the insecure posts liked the sample data, while the secure ones were dominant afterwards. Older security-related posts are less reliable probably because some recently revealed the vulnerabilities outdated <coughs> the older suggestions. Oh, we found only few secure answers which were provided to correct the outdated older insecure suggestions. When we look at the distribution of the post for each category, we found that there are many more insecure snippets than the secure ones in the SSL TLS category, which indicates that developers should be very cautious when they try to search for some coding solutions related to SSL, TLS, on Stack Overflow. Uh, meanwhile, secure answers dominate the other categories, accounting for 54% of the symmetric posts, 94% of asymmetric posts, 71% of hush posts, and 52% uh, of random posts. For the second question, we compare the secure and the insecure posts in terms of their scores. Uh, comments, counts, the reputation scores of the answer providers, the favorite counts, and the view counts. Alarmingly, on average, insecure posts received a higher score, more comments, more favorites, and more views. It implies two things. First, more user attention has been attracted by insecure answers. Second, users cannot rely on the voting system or this cross-sourcing model to identify secure answers. 
Two possible reasons can explain the higher average score of insecure coding suggestions. First, general developers usually upvote insecure code because the code is compilable, executable, simple, and it doesn't run with, with any runtime error. It basically like run smoothly. However, such users do not have sufficient expertise to check the security property of the suggested code. <coughs> Meanwhile, although security experts have the domain knowledge to, to, to de download the insecure code or identify the insecure code, their reputation can decrease when they try to download other people's posts. And sometimes it's quite possible that some security experts' reputation can become so low that they cannot or they are not allowed to download anyone's post. We further conducted the MyWitme U test to examine whether the distributions of metadata present significant differences between the secure and the insecure code. Interestingly, the responders of the secure post have significantly higher reputation, although the effect size is negligible. It basically means that although we sometimes can rely on the people with high reputation to provide a secure code, in many scenarios, we, we still cannot fully trust these highly reputated people. This is because people can earn a high <coughs> reputation for being an expert in areas other than security. For the third question, we apply the Man with Me U test to the two groups of code clones, secure groups versus insecure groups. We found that on average, insecure clones have more duplicates than the secure ones. The difference between the two distributions is statistically significant, although the effect size is negligible. It basically means that repetitiveness doesn't guarantee security. So users cannot assume a snippet to be secure only because this snippet has been recommended multiple times by different users. Lastly, we conducted two case studies to explore why duplicated code was suggested and we identified two reasons. First, users asked some similar or related questions, which lead to similar answers. And some users blindly copied and pasted the code to answer more questions and earn more points, even though some of the times these provided answers may be that not that closely related to the questions. Although we didn't identify any user that intentionally misled people by posting the insecure answers, we didn't observe any mechanism designed to prevent such malicious behaviors either. To conclude, we intended to assess the reliability of the cross-source knowledge of, on, on security implementation <coughs> and revealed a worrisome reality. We found that based on the comparable distribution of the secure and the insecure code on Stack Overflow, users being layman in security rely on additional guidance and advice. However, the community feedback doesn't provide such guidance that users need. The reputation mechanism fails in uh, indicating trustworthy users with respect to security questions, ultimately leaving other users wandering around alone in a software security minefield. We still need more effort by tool builders, security experts, stack overflow developers, and even designers of cross-sourcing model or cross-sourcing platforms to improve the security of code suggestions on the website. So this concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Um, in the beginning of your talk, it looked like you were able to backtrack from an application's code that it came from a stack overflow. Uh -huh. That is not our work, but some, by other Someone researchers. Else did. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Does this undermine the philosophy that many eyes make bugs shallow, make all bugs shallow? What do you mean by many eyes? Uh, it's a common quote in the open source community that the more people have access to the code, the more bugs they discover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, according to our experience, uh, Stack Overflow, even though these posts are popularly visited, you can, based on this view counts, in many scenarios, you still can see that the security property is not carefully checked. And, but, but sometimes it's maybe the other way around. Let's say if some code is insecure, but it is simple enough, such code can become very popularly used by people. And the people would like to upload them, even give, assign them like accepted answers. Yeah. 
Um, it appears uh, other uh, institutions are, are pouring research, kind of like this, mm -hmm. analyzing uh, the security of uh, online uh, code snippets. Mm -hmm. And it appears there's uh, some uh, automated code checking tools existing already to uh, check uh, Stack Overflow code snippets to uh, check if they're secure or not. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also recently also like learned about some recent publications which leverage this machine learning or deep learning to try to automatically classify this, uh, this, uh, this code snippets to see whether they are secure or not. But before this one, we didn't do that. We just did the manual checking. And even before this research, we also observed that some machine learning model was, were proposed to try to classify the code snippets as secure or insecure. But because the, 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 the accuracy is not 100%, so we cannot fully really trust it. Even though, sure, we can say that many inspection may also have some human bias or not, but so at, at least uh, we try our best to ensure the accuracy. Well, if we just uh, go ahead to use some existing machine learning model, first we cannot guarantee that whether that machine learning model is trained based on the data which is sufficient enough to cover our data set. And second, we even don't know in what kind of scenarios those models do not work well or work poorly. So, so based on that kind of that situation around that time, we decided to do the manual inspection. But sure, that, that automatic tool can be used when more or better like machine learning models are available. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. by prior research. And so according to the security researchers, all these vulnerabilities seem to be well known. Everybody knows that in this community. But if we look at the real security practices done by developers, we realize that there's a significant gap between the security theory and the security practice. And then this, this research basically indicates this big gap and it also kind of like motivates us for the next step to try to provide tool support for the developers to better build their secure code. Yeah. Okay, thank you for all these questions. Okay, so let us uh, welcome our uh, next speaker, Professor uh, Red Miles. So he is a professor here at UC Irvine, and uh, Dr. Red Miles' research focuses on. Uh, let me find it. Just give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> focuses on distributed and collaborative software engineering, especially focusing on the aspects of awareness uh, and mm -hmm. trust among collaborators. And Dr. Red Miles is also a recipient of very prestigious. Uh, SEM Distinguished Scientist Award. So, without further ado, I'll let Dr. Redman speak. Well, thanks very much. And uh, I often find myself starting a talk by saying, now for something different, because uh, we've heard some nice talks about security. Uh, but now I'm going to talk to you about uh, a broader area and in preparing for this, uh, of human aspects of software engineering. And in preparing for today, I took this as an opportunity to reflect on a lot of uh, things uh, from the past, some history of uh, human aspects of software engineering studies that were done at Irvine, and uh, give you a, a sense of, of looking to the uh, present and the future uh, with some of the work that my research group is doing now. Uh, so we'll look at some historical context, especially because it's such a rich context here at Irvine, and we'll also look at some current examples. 
and you'll be able to see some of those in the poster sessions. So I couldn't resist uh, starting with a quote from our dean. And it, out in the lobby, you'll see a rack with a, a magazine with a wolf on the cover. And uh, that's a machine learning problem uh, that a lot of you will recognize, and we heard some about today, uh, recognizing images. But in the opening to that uh, ICS year in review, he says, since its early days at UC Irvine, computing has been viewed as much more than a new technical discipline. It has been approached as a new human technology frontier. And along those lines, uh, many of you know Richard Taylor, who was here earlier, uh, and the um, uh, former director of ISR, or the founding di director. Uh, and uh, there's out on the table, you can find a history of software engineering that was done uh, last year, or the year before, uh, for our 50th anniversary. But in it, he talks about the interdisciplinary nature of the study of software engineering here at Irvine, <coughs> and including uh, such uh, disciplines as human-computer interaction. And then uh, another influence that uh, was very strong at Irvine and came to be known as the Irvine School for a long time uh, was the work by John King and Rob Kling. Uh, uh, tragically, Rob Kling passed away, but in writing about Rob Kling's work, uh, John King wrote about uh, looking at systems as more than just the technical components we're used to, but also things such as the staff required to support the systems, the organizational protocols and practices in which computing takes place, uh, these major elements of the task domain, and the institutional context so for many decades, Irvine had this sense that you didn't just drop computing in the world, but you had to look at the context in which it was going to uh, uh, be deployed and how that was going to affect the environment into which it was uh, deployed. Uh, just to do some big way, that's John King at the top, and he was a former team here, and uh, Rob Kling, uh, picture. But Rob Kling did a lot of his work also with Walt Skocky, and some of you who've come to former ISR events, you'll recognize uh, Walt. And Walt made a major contribution to finding the area of socio-technical design. And again, looking at not just the technology component, but how that was going to fit in with end users, organizations, and uh, including uh, societal uh, uh, norms and needs. Uh, I had the pleasure of working in the area of end-user development and meeting Maria Francesca Castabili uh, from the University of Bari. And uh, she writes, and she has really promoted an area called meta-design and end-user design, which takes these problems of, of deploying systems and looking them <coughs> at an evolutionary or a co-evolutionary process between end-users and uh, the developers, so it's no longer the model just dropping a system on end users. Uh, she has another, I, quote, I have a quote here from this paper, End Users as Co-Designers, but she also has this other paper, I really enjoy the title, and it's End Users as Unwitting Software Developers. <laughs> because when we deploy things into the world, you end up doing some software development uh, in order to be able to use things. And, um, <laughs> Uh, just a few more quotes, but uh, Clarice de Souza from uh, uh, univers uh, the Catholic University in Rio, uh, whom I'm working with right now, she also does a lot of work in meta-communication. Her theory of approaching systems design is based on semiotics, uh, st uh, a discipline coming out of linguistics, but she looks at system design as a communication between the developers and the eventual end users. And so breakdowns that occur when using uh, technology, they can be cast in this conversational context, this uh, communication context, where there's a breakdown in communication, what the developers intended for the end users to do versus, uh, you know, we know best, right? Developers always know best for the end users. But again, there's a, a process of adoption that has to take place. And I'll look at that in a modern sample. And I uh, have to acknowledge my own uh, doctorate advisor, Gerhard Fischer, who in this very nice paper uh, called Desert Island, and um, uh, for some of you who don't know, this is kind of a construct, like if you are stuck on a deserted island, uh, what three papers would you like to have? And so 
Uh, this is a short but very nice paper I give a lot of my students to read. And he talks about uh, software engineering as basically a human uh, discipline. And for my final quote, I want to bring in the authority of Fred Brooks, who uh, in his No Silver Bullet paper uh, concludes by talking a lot about a focus on people and developing great designers and even um, provides what some of us call a curriculum uh, for educating and mentoring them. So these are many different dimensions uh, to um, uh, perspectives on end users, uh, communication between developers and end users, uh, training <laughs> developers, how do you raise them up, uh, and, and problems of looking at software developers also as, uh, as human uh, consumers of software themselves. So I'm happy to say that at the International <coughs> Conference on Software Engineering, there's a growing community interested in this problem. So beyond just the work I'll talk about today, I encourage you to look at things such as the Chase Workshop at ICSI. Uh, that's the workshop on cooperative and human aspects of software engineering. The uh, a recent workshop that uh, has been going uh, well for, a, a, I think it's fourth or fifth year now, uh, <laughs> that focuses on emotion act, at, uh, aspects in software engineering, including the state of developers when they make errors in coding. And then the Software Engineering and Society track, again, focusing on human aspects. And they cover very many uh, topics, collaboration, teams, awareness, trust, culture, uh, and software tools. So it's a broad and uh, it's growing community of interest in this uh, area of human aspects of software engineering. Uh, so from my own research group, uh, I picked a few examples and uh, we'll see what I, until I get call time. Uh, but I mentioned Clarice de Souza, uh, who takes a semiotic view of designing systems. And I'm co-advising a student with her uh, who uh, spent a year here doing a study of inter, uh, Internet of Things technology. And so uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, you know, it's nice, it's exciting. Uh, when you go in the stores, including Home Depot now, you see... Uh, in nice, all these nice and neat little boxes on the shelf, but then you take all that home and you've got to put it together and get it to work, right? Um, and, and, you're, and some uh, consumers of this technology, they're using uh, products from different vendors, uh, even different technologies, although most of them work over wireless, is one prevailing model. Uh, but what do end users actually do with this and how do they figure out to make this part of their lives? And so, um, and what are the theoretical challenges around this technology that are different from traditional technology? I mean, just very uh, briefly, you're looking at problems going from distributed computing to distributed interaction. The system becomes this ecosystem of different cyber physical systems. Uh, there are multiple aspects of interaction, and then you're trying to combine these, and some are also in. Uh, um, proactive, intelligent, smart kinds of devices. Although smart doesn't always do what we really want. So the goal um, that the, our student Bruno Chagas is working towards is to building a, a theoretically based descriptive model uh, of how users appropriate or adopt and um, adapt technology, IoT technology. And we're taking the semiotic engineering uh, theoretical approach. And so from that perspective, as I mentioned earlier, you have developers, you have end users. Uh, you can view it from a semiotic point of view of communication. What are the developers trying to tell the end users? What are they hearing? And what does that mean, telling the end users? It's through the physical device, which is almost like a black box in a sense. But even uh, more sophisticated end users, they're given APIs and they're given uh, interfaces to these devices. But there's still a communication gap because developers in their uh, model, or their mental model of how the world will work, may be different from how the consumers actually see it, especially in this technology that's so ubiquitous. So we did a study where we started with a workshop distributed to the participants, uh, a bunch of devices that was there reported. <coughs> if they stayed through the study for um, four weeks, then they would be able to take the devices home. That was the incentive, as well as some compensation. 
Uh, but we collected data. We had them keep diaries of their use of the uh, uh, of um, technology and how things were going. And there was a focus on breakdown. So when there were problems with the uh, technology or successes, these were entered into the diary. And then we uh, organized these uh, using uh, some uh, theories of uh, semiotic, uh, uh, semiotics and analysis. Um, skip to that. Uh, so we're still in the process of analyzing all the data from those diary entries, but certain kinds of activities started to emerge. So again, the kind of the general problem is you've got the user from the starting point on the left. Uh, they don't quite know what to do with the things they brought home from the store. Uh, they go through some kind of learning process if they're successful to go and adopt an adoption process if they're successful to, uh, to uh, uh, use the technology. But what happens in this box, and that's where we were interested in developing uh, a more detailed model. So again, uh, through analyzing the diary entries, especially <coughs> around the breakdowns, we were able to uh, derive categories uh, representative of the kinds of activities that were taking place. Things like uh, just being able to glance or surfacing. Uh, I'll, I'll go through these in a moment. But uh, look, everything from just looking at the uh, looking at the devices out of the box, maybe they match, maybe they don't match. Uh, then you try more uh, sophisticated things like combining them, and then the expressing stage is actually. Uh, adapting them to your use and expressing a new kind of activity with them. So we're trying to fill in this uh, middle box of what goes on between start gate, end gate, and we uh, hope that this model will be able to help um, uh, designers uh, think about the problems uh, and anticipate problems before they develop and deploy uh, technologies. So uh, pretty much said this slide, but uh, we see this as a problem of fit, and uh, uh, we're looking at models of appropriation, and we seek to inform design with these models that we're developing. Another example uh, from a very different perspective of looking at software engineering is uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of gender bias takes place in social software development platforms like GitHub or even Stack Overflow, uh, but we're focused on GitHub right now. Uh, so my student, uh, Jingdong Wong, along with a former student who uh, uh, collaborates with us, uh, uh, Yi Wong, uh, we looked at the problems of, of imbalance by gender in, in GitHub. So a little bit of back background. I mean, I think uh, most people now are aware that uh, women developers account for a smaller percentage of the workforce, and there's been a lot of media uh, information about how they're paid less as well. Uh, but the open source community, which seems, which should be a meritocracy, should be, and it's uh, anonymous to some degree, should be a chance or a platform in which uh, women could have more participation and also learn uh, about development techniques. However, many of the same biases exist in GitHub. In fact, uh, looking through, um, uh, looking at GitHub and, and users on GitHub, uh, women owned only less than 5% of the project, and there were no women in the top uh, 100 lists. So how do you explain this? Well, uh, some. Uh, organizational psychologists have postulated the following explanation, and it's captured pretty much in the title of their 2016 paper, that there is a competence <coughs> and confidence gap in organizations, and that being competent is not always enough for women to be perceived as conf confident. Uh, so what, is, what does this actually mean? So they, they define this concept of uh, in more detail, they define this concept as social attractiveness, the extent to which others uh, like an individual and want to bond with them, you know, so be pals with. Uh, but they demonstrate in their study that the perception of competence for women required a degree of social attractiveness 
that was not required for men to be perceived as competent. So this, hence they come up with this confidence, confidence gap. So what does social attractiveness mean in GitHub? Well, briefly in our study, it uh, translated to the number of followers. And then if that is the uh, variable we're looking at, uh, how does that uh, mediate, uh, 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 how does that mediate uh, perceptions of confidence? And so looking at the top 5,000 developers, which uh, we really need to give kudos to Jing Dong, who looked through a lot of these manually, um, identifying 143 uh, women. Uh, and we applied a Granger causality test to look at the relationship between increasing followers and positive evaluation of pull requests. And sure enough, we found that in more cases than not, uh, when women developers had an increase in followers, they had a successful uh, pull request. And this was not an effect that was uh, prevalent among the male developers, but it was, again, uh, the more followers that a woman developer had, the more um, uh, successful pull requests they would have. So what do we do about this? So what we've been trying to do is identify uh, strategies such as role models that could be followed. We're looking at new portals for uh, uh, social coding platforms with new rules that might be more equitable. Uh, we're looking at uh, leveraging education. And so today at the poster session, you can see some of the work that um, Yang Yu is doing uh, in trying to automatically uh, and looking at problems around classifying gender on GitHub because, like I said, we did a lot of work manually, but an important step in uh, continuing these studies would be to have some automation around identifying uh, gender. And then we also have uh, Jing Dong Wang, who's continuing the work, looking at what does expertise mean on, on uh, GitHub. So I am going to I have one more example, but I'm going to breeze through it. I think I've mentioned this in a previous talk, or you might have, some of you who've been here before might have seen uh, the work we did, where we were trying to look at improving teamwork, and particularly senses of trust and cohesion and positive emotion. So again, a kind of a different angle, but on, uh, on human aspects of software development. But when you have people who are distributed, uh, how do they develop trust? How do they feel a sense of the team? Uh, we did an experiment where people, both in distributed and co-located settings, uh, did drawing together. And we tried different types of drawing, directed drawing, undirected drawing. And we looked at how uh, just this drawing intervention would improve the cohesion or just the positive sense of the team from the participants. Uh, so we learned that informal interactions around uh, art actually did improve uh, people's positive emotions from the benchmark from the start. Uh, we've tried this out with, first with students here at Irvine, but then uh, the student who worked on this, Moon Yao Zhao, was able to try this out on some professional developers that, uh, in teams. Uh, but what other approaches might be tried? Like, what other kinds of interventions could be tried to improve, uh, to improve a sense of, uh, of uh, cohesion and trust and uh, good emotions around teams? So my brand new master's student, uh, Alyssa, will be doing a poster on trying out improvisational theater to improve collaboration on software engineering teams. So. Uh, in conclusion, <laughs> I have given you some historical context. For me, uh, preparing for today was important to acknowledge the rich history here at Irvine about looking at the human aspects of software engineering. And I've tried to give you a sense of how broad and diverse this area can be, but I hope also how real these problems uh, can be, uh, especially as the world uh, becomes more complex with, and software uh, becomes more prevalent. Um, so there are many more examples you can uh, find. Um, 
uh, from industry, our friends at Microsoft are doing a lot of work in these human aspects. And just to conclude some reflection, I mean, so well, the quotes in the beginning talked about software engineering as a human activity, but I want to emphasize the point that, which seems obvious, but it should fit human activity, and we, that's another reason we need to look at the human aspects of software development. And I believe that looking at these, researching them from different perspectives or from different, uh, different aspects uh, can inform design. And there's much more to be done, but uh, I'm uh, encouraged because we have such a rich history in uh, this research here at Irvine, and I think there's a lot to build on from that. So that's uh, my talk. We have some time for a couple of quick questions. With the intra or interdisciplinary approach, what have been the contributions from the social sciences to the sociology, psychology, or similar subject, subject matters that take the knowledge, general knowledge from those areas? and provide it for use in uh, software engineering to observe uh, the, either the mechanism or to detect mechanisms that are operating, whether it's in the design of the software or interaction or the usage. Well, social sciences are actually very broad, but uh, the student, former student I mentioned, uh, Yi Wang, um, who some of you might have met as Oliver. Uh, we worked with uh, some faculty in social sciences to use their modeling techniques, which I didn't talk about today, but we've used uh, game theoretic models, uh, borrowing from economists, but also uh, social, um, social scientists. Another dimension from social sciences is the theory about signals and how people uh, signal authentic or inauthentic intentions and this, of course, can affect teamwork. So we've looked at those kinds of theories to see how, especially how they're affecting teamwork. And I think more broadly from the social sciences, you can see concerns about uh, issues around gender and uh, participation of uh, multiple groups in our, in our society. So I think there's, there's very detailed modeling that can be taken from that, as well as uh, more general things. And we also look at uh, ma business and management, where uh, some of these studies of teams have been done, but, uh, but tried to take them further. Yeah? Okay, so let us thank the presenter. <laughs>